The company that restarted the top speed wars has a new entry and a new target for exclusive high-end hypercar performance. This is the latest from Bugatti. Built to shatter top speed records and hurl people way past 200 miles an hour in the lap of luxury. Bugatti has since become the gold standard of bonkers hypercars. Since then, they've topped all kinds of lists. The two most notable are fastest and most expensive. Since then, the Bugatti has been joined by other hand-built exclusives engineered within an inch of their lives. Does the new Chiron stand up? Every Bugatti that has rolled out of the factory since the company came back into existence in 1998, starting with the Veyron, has been a bench racer's dream. The engine put out just shy of 1,000 horsepower, and the trip from a standstill to 60 miles an hour took just 2.4 seconds on its way to a mind-boggling 267 miles per hour. That's it. Pack it in. The fastest road car ever has been built. Nothing more to see here. Apparently, you can't tell an automotive engineer that fastest has been achieved. The likes of Koenigsegg and Hennessy soon took the top speed crown from Bugatti. Enter the Bugatti Chiron. The numbers for this car are not just insane, they sound made up. Horsepower now reaches 1,479. That's the power of 10 PT cruisers. Wait, that doesn't put it in the right perspective. That's equivalent to three Tesla Model S's or two C7 Corvette Z06's. Of those two, only the Tesla could keep up with the Chiron in the Sprint to 60 after the aerodynamics and physics take over. Incidentally, you could buy 10 PT cruisers, three Tesla Model S's, and two Corvettes, and still have plenty of money left over to buy a house with a big enough yard for all those cars for the price of a Chiron. If you were looking for an elegantly appointed reclining chair and accompanying infotainment system that just so happened to be surrounded by some of the most sophisticated go-fast tech ever developed, you'd need $3 million just to start. $3 million gets you the Civic of Bugatti Chirons, not the Civic Type R of Chirons. For that, you have to decide what flavor of crazy you are. At this point, you should know as soon as the Chiron set a speed record, some shop laid out copious amounts of carbon fiber around an engine engineered within an inch of its life to go even faster. So Bugatti has the Super Sport 300, which finally stops accelerating at just over 304 miles per hour, providing you have a speedway long enough and the time to have Bugatti engineers come by and set you up with tires that can handle 4,400 61 pounds of car, knocking out miles 11 seconds at a time. For those who might rightfully think, well, how often is that going to come up? Might not care that they own a car that for a moment was the fastest car ever made. Maybe they want to take their several million dollar car out for a track day with anyone else who had 200 bucks, a helmet, and a car that could pass inspection. What could go wrong? I mean, other than so, so many things. For those who live the life of danger with other weekend warriors, the Chiron comes in pure sport that sheds weight and beefs up suspension and aerodynamics to keep the car glued to the track. Maybe you don't want to explain that your exclusive hypercar is in the shop because someone in a hopped up Acura thought they could outbreak you into turn seven. Perhaps you like to think that this Bugatti is the same company that built cars like the legendary Grand Prix dominating Type 35. For those that like a little history in their future, the ANS 110 celebrates 110 years of the Bugatti nameplate, from the Type 35 to the underrated EB110 supercar from the 90s. Anyone who's had their ticket upgraded at the airport knows a simple depressing truth, there's always another upgrade. For the Bugatti crowd, that comes in the form of their one-offs. For those who are serious about their limited edition cars, how limited? Bugatti has to invite you to buy one. Otherwise, please exit through the gift shop. These include the Devo, which takes the track-based intentions of the Pure Sport and commits even more to it. Mechanically, it's a Chiron with the powerful W16 sitting in the middle. But rather than upgrading the Chiron's trackability, the Devo is built for it from the ground up for corners and comes at a premium of $5.4 million. The La Voiture Noire takes on the impossible task of evoking one of the best-looking cars ever made, the Bugatti Type 57S Atlantique. Like the ANS 110, it's riddled with an Easter egg hunt of cues to the history of Bugatti. And like the Devo, these are built from the ground up. For that kind of privilege, a total of one was sold for the absolutely staggering price of $18.7 million. Unlike that Sentra you bought when you graduated college, these cars don't depreciate as often as they go up in value. When that private buyer gets tired of looking at the La Voiture Noire in their air-conditioned garage, it could command an even higher price. 
To celebrate 110 years of Bugatti, the French company made the Cento Dieci, which is Italian for 110. Just in case it wasn't clear what country these cars were aimed at defeating, all of this adds up to a set of cars with eye-watering performance and face-flattening speed. How could something like this come into being? What kind of mad genius would create such a thing? A lot of them, to be sure. But at the top was one mad scientist giving everyone their marching orders to build a car that was fast, powerful, and comfortable to drive. That man was Ferdinand Piesch. Piesch might not sound familiar, but his grandfather should be recognizable. He was Ferdinand Porsche. The two Ferdinands shared more than just lineage. They shared a love for finding ways to make fast, ridiculously fast. In his time at Porsche, Piesch developed the Porsche 917, which was so dominant, the rules for the series it competed in had to be changed. At some point, Dr. Ferry decided that Porsches should no longer run Porsche because they were all too focused on racing. But that didn't prevent Piesch from finding his way to the head of Dr. Ferry's other creation, Volkswagen. Under Piesch's leadership, VW developed a narrow-angle V6 called the VR6 that allowed them to put V6 power in smaller packages, like their Golf GTI. Naturally, if one VR6 engine is good, two must be great, right? Two VR6 engines were set side-by-side side sharing a crankshaft. The four banks of cylinders now formed a W, thus the W12. This combination now lives on in the Volkswagen Auto Group's other high-end luxury brand, Bentley, and a few select Audi and VW products. Volkswagen did create a W12 concept supercar, but the world wasn't ready for a Volkswagen-branded supercar. That meant that Piesch needed a new demonstration platform for his new engine layout, this time marrying two V8s into a W16. That's when the benchmarks of 1,000 HP, 250 miles an hour, and comfort came from. To solve the issue of badging, he bought the Bugatti badge to go on his mad creation. Bugatti, in a way, was one of the first exotic car companies. Formed by Ettore Bugatti in France, their bright blue Type 35s were more than a match for the red Alphas and Maseratis coming out of Italy, and were the standard for the gentleman racer and frontrunner alike. They even would become part of the celebrity themselves, like driver Hele Nice, who became known as the Bugatti Queen after Ettore took a liking to her take-no-prisoners driving style. The company died with its creator shortly after World War II and stayed dormant until an Italian designer bought the name to make limited edition supercars in 1987, resulting in the Bugatti EB110. When the Veyron came on the scene, there was already a car that everyone had thought ended the top speed wars for good, the McLaren F1. Designed by Gordon Murray to celebrate McLaren's success in Formula One, it too was a monument to excess. Powered by a 618 horsepower BMW V12, the unique three-seater was good for 232 miles per hour. Everyone agreed that that was crazy and a record that would never be broken. Then, Piesh and Bugatti broke it. And everyone agreed that was crazy and a record that would never be broken. Then, a tuner that made its name Hot Rodding Dodge Vipers made a faster car, the Hennessy Venom GT. Each new announcement of a car from Koenigsegg or Gumpert or Hennessy, the clock starts on when the next car will announce even scarier numbers. Even Tesla has gotten in the game, with the upcoming Tesla Roadster aiming for a top speed north of 250 miles per hour. The prevailing wisdom even among the makers of these insane rides has been that now that the 300 mile per hour barrier has been broken, it's just too ridiculous to make the cars go any faster. Even Le Mans prototypes don't reach these speeds. Speaking of Le Mans, the formula for the top cars have changed to reflect the impact that Bugatti has had on the hypercar market. For the last few decades, the top category for the French Endurance Classic has been purpose-built prototype race cars. But starting next season, whenever that may be, the Le Mans organizing body has switched back to a production-based car series, Le Mans Hypercar. Similar to the GT1 regulations of the 90s, as long as a manufacturer makes at least 25 examples for the road, their 26th can compete at Le Mans. Aston Martin has delayed its development of the Valkyrie hypercar into a race car. While Bugatti has no current plans to go hypercar racing, the McLaren also had no intention of racing the McLaren F1 until owners felt it was perfect for GT1, changing the nature of that series forever. Should Bugatti return to racing, it couldn't have a better backer. Volkswagen Auto Group stablemate Audi was responsible for one of the most successful modern prototype race cars ever made. The Audi prototype racers R8, R10, and R18 got so good at winning, they got bored with it. For one year, they even dressed that car up in Bentley clothes, 
to return that brand to its Le Mans roots, where Bentleys dominated pre-war Le Mans racing. For those not looking to race through the night, Bugatti still has plans for the future. Arguably, anything more you could do with the W18 would just be silly. So Bugatti is looking to the future with a potential electric model. The Lotus Aviha with its 1,972 horsepower proves that just because you go green doesn't mean you have to give up all the go. So expect an electric Bugatti to still pack silly numbers. Current conditions have forced the company to delay plans for an entry-level car for mere millionaires that was targeted for half a million to a million dollars. While few of us will ever see a Bugatti, much less be invited to buy one, it will remain for the time being the benchmark for bench racing. That's what Bugatti has on offer today. Are you a pure sport track day person or the Sport 300 super speed kind? Let us know in the comments. And while you're there, be sure and subscribe to The Richest for the latest videos in your inbox. See you next time.